All right. Good afternoon and welcome to our information session on the PIA Network, an initiative of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. My name is Sarah Oldmixon and I serve as the Managing Director of PIA here at New America. I'll be joined today by my colleague Kelly Betty, a Senior Policy Analyst on our policy team, PIA team. We're also grateful for the production support from our colleague Fabio Murgia, who's a Communications and Multimedia Associate with, associate with the Education Policy Program here at New America. Um, just a couple of things to note before we get to started with today's program. Please keep your line on mute to help us minimize background noise. You're welcome to drop questions in the chat box throughout the call today. We'll also try to reserve a few minutes at the end of the call for you to come off of mute and ask any questions you may have. If you need assistance during to call, today's call, please feel free to send a direct message to Fabio using the chat and he will try to assist you. Um, finally, please note that today's call is being recorded and we'll, uh, that a recording of the call will be made available online after. Fabio, can we go to the next slide? One more. So just to give you a sense of where we're headed, um, we'll start off by giving you a little bit more background information about the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, tell you a little bit about what you can expect um, as a member of the PIA network, describe who can participate in the PIA network and how to become a member, and then reserve a little bit of time for Q&A at the end of the call. So with that, I'll hand things over to my colleague, Kelly. Hi, everyone. All right, Fabio, if you could go a few slides ahead to our PIA slide. Excellent. All right, so PIA is the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, and it's a multi-year, multi-partner initiative that supports place-based efforts to expand access to high-quality apprenticeship opportunities for high school age youth. PIO was launched in 2018, five years ago, by a group of partners who were committed to seeing apprenticeship, this long-standing, effective method of bridging the gap between adolescence and adulthood, grow here in the United States. Next slide, please, Fabio. So how do we go about doing that? So we go about supporting the expansion of youth apprenticeship through three main strategies. The first is the grants initiative that's helping 15 local partnerships launch and grow programs in their communities. And the second is why we're here today. It's the PIA Network, a field building program that provides both guidance from experts and peer to peer learning opportunities for a national network that's currently about 50 local partnerships strong. And underpinning both of these is an aligned research and communications effort to expand the field's understanding about works when it comes to youth apprenticeship, to strengthen the base of evidence around youth apprenticeship, and then to use that to make the case for policy action and investment by America's leaders. Next slide, Fabio. So this work is supported by a group of visionary funders who banded together to support, um, to support this work so we thank the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, J.P. Morgan Chase, Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, the Siemens Foundation, the Schmidt Foundation, slash Harbor Freight Tools for Schools, and the Walton Family Foundation for their support, which makes all of this possible, including um, participation in the network for free to those who are eligible. And next slide. And here are the national partners, leading organizations who make up the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. So these are the experts who coordinate the exclusive learning opportunities that are open to PIA Network members, and you'll be hearing from some of them in just a little bit. Next slide. So one of the very first things that the partnership did when they got together was work to create a definition for youth apprenticeship. There is not a national definition of youth apprenticeship at the federal level. Some states have definitions, but they vary. So establishing a shared definition was an important first step. We're sharing this definition with all of you now because it's a key part of network membership. There are many types of excellent work-based learning out there. The PIA network is designed to support communities who are working specifically on apprenticeships that look like this. So, a youth apprenticeship that is a structured work-based learning program designed to start when apprentices are in high school or are of high school age for programs who are working primarily with out-of-school youth. And that has these four key features. 
they're paid opportunities, paid on the job learning under the supervision of skilled employee mentors. In addition to the learning that's happening on the job, there's learning in the classroom. Number three, there's ongoing assessment of apprentice learning against established skills and competency standards. And four, when an apprentice has successfully completed their apprenticeship, they'll have earned both an industry recognized credential and post-secondary credit. You'll notice that this is very similar to the definition of registered apprenticeship. And some youth apprenticeships in the United States are registered, but not all are. And it's not a requirement for membership in the PIA network that your youth apprenticeship be registered. Next slide. In addition to establishing a definition of youth apprenticeship, the partnership also established a set of five design principles for high quality youth apprenticeship. So the definition describes what a youth apprenticeship is, and these design principles are supposed to help describe what a good youth apprenticeship is. So these principles are intended to be both practical and aspirational and provide clear guidance to industry, education, and community leaders, as well as policymakers, about what quality looks like when it comes to youth apprenticeship. So these five design principles, to start out with, career-oriented. Youth apprenticeships should be uh, leading to jobs that have a future and set the apprentices up to earn family sustaining wages. The next design principle is equitable. These opportunities should be available to any student in a community with additional supports for students who are traditionally marginalized. The third design principle is portability. These programs should come with college credit that leads to a degree. Next is adaptability. So someone who completes an apprenticeship should have the credentials and know-how to be hired by any employer in that industry, not just the employer they apprentice with. And finally, accountability. Good programs will track their outcomes and use it to get keep getting better over time. So these design principles we're sharing with you now because as members of the PIA network, we want um, we want you to be on board with these design principles and to be creating programs that might not meet each of these right now, but that's what you're working towards. All right, next slide. All right. So about the PIA network, what you're all here today to learn more about, and my colleague Sarah will go into more detail, but just to set the stage a little bit, the purpose of this PIA network is to be a learning community that's created to recognize you all, connect you to one another, and support- Can I learn about Oh, I think someone came off mute a little bit. <laughs> All right. So, um, and support youth apprenticeship partnerships across the U.S. Because we all know that we can only do so much when we're working alone. And that often being able to talk to other people who are trying to build and scale youth apprenticeships is the most valuable type of learning. So the goal of the PIA network is to support that peer-to-peer -peer connection as well as helping to build and support the field as a whole in the goal of creating a true system of youth apprenticeship in the US. So with that, I will turn it back over to Sarah to go into more details about PIA Network membership. Thanks, Kelly. So I'm gonna spend just a minute walking through what you could expect um, to be able to participate and if you opt in to join the PIA Network. Um, Fabio, can you go to the next slide? The PIA Network provides programming throughout the year that offers both learning and networking opportunities for youth apprenticeship practitioners and leaders. Next slide. As we emerge from the pandemic, we're particularly excited to be able to grow the number of in-person offerings that we plan to host over the next year, which will include opportunities like site visits and learning tours of several leading youth apprenticeship programs around the country, academies that bring together PIA network members for deep dives into topics like employer engagement, meetups that convene near peers for affinity group conversations about specialized shared interests like deploying youth apprenticeships in rural communities or building inclusive youth apprenticeship programs for youth with disabilities, and in addition to opportunities to participate in national convenings hosted by PIA's partners. Next slide. 
As in years past, we'll also continue to host a wide range of virtual offerings like webinars on topics like building effective partnerships and sustainability. Next slide. And your PIA membership also includes access to a range of tools and publications produced by New America and our partners. Next slide. And maybe most excitingly, and really I think what adds a lot of the value to this network is that PIA network membership provides opportunities for you to interact with and get guidance from our incredible network of national partners, each of which bring unique expertise and experience to the table. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we can actually close out the slide deck here for just a second if you want to Fabio and I'm pleased to be able to introduce um, several special speakers that we have joining us today to talk a little bit about their experience with the PIA network. Um, and I'm going to kick it off with um, Sean Kelly from Boise. Sean, can you share a little bit about your experience? Yeah, hi, I'm Sean Kelly. I'm the system principal and uh, career development and industry liaison here at uh, Dennis Technical Education Center in Boise, Idaho. Um, we first got involved with uh, apprenticeship through the um, initial grant um, opportunity. Um, we applied for the grant. Um, we had been dipping our toes into apprenticeship and this, we happened to see the opportunity. And, and for us, it was, we weren't sure what we were going to do with the money. And, and in many ways, I've, I've told a few people, we we're actually glad we didn't get the money because what we were looking for was the networking, which we became, we were offered to be able to be a part of the, the network. And that was what was most uh, advantageous for us is because we we're so new into it. And as a CTS, we're fairly well funded from a bunch of different sources. So we really just needed the connections and the people to brainstorm and, and see what other people were doing, the mistakes they made, the, the challenges that they had to overcome as we were just so new into it. Um, and it gave us the opportunities. We got involved in a few different things. Um, I took advantage early on of the open office hours, which then hooked me up with Martha Ponji and um, Scott Ellsworth at the time. And they helped us. We put on a, a statewide apprenticeship accelerator. It was going to be in person with a big signing, but then of course COVID happened. So we we flipped quickly and turned it into a, our first virtual event, which has then kind of become sort of an annual one now. Um, and then Martha has also been huge. She's been helping because she was part of the New York Manufacturing Alliance. She's helping our Idaho Manufacturing Alliance set up their apprenticeships and, and become a, a sponsor. And so that was just all the connections that we're able to do. And then um, the people I've gotten to meet on JFF, um, PIA, uh, Advanced CTE, um, and I got the opportunity to be a part of the Youth Apprenticeship um, Data Framework Committee, where we, we developed that um, publication that came on on that. So it was really just for us, it was huge to be able to have all these different people across the country to network and brainstorm and, and uh, develop these great relationships that help get us to where we are now. Great, thank you so much, Sean. Um, let me kick it to Ryan Gensler next. Ryan is one of our national hub partners um, with, with CareerWise. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. It's great to see all of you. Hi, I'm Ryan Gensler. I'm with CareerWise and on our national team. Um, we are both a practitioner intermediary in Colorado, where we have several hundred high school apprentices across uh, about 30 modern uh, non-traditional occupations, insurance, banking, accounting, tech, um, et cetera, and also a network of intermediaries um, sharing kind of shared infrastructure and resources and learning uh, across the country in about five other states and six other regions um, as, as well. We've been a part of the PIA network um, and since the beginning and, and got to share some of our early insights learning in Colorado um, with, with New America and PIA to inform some of those initial uh, PIA principles, which are still kind of our guiding uh, um, kind of North Star of, of what we are building towards um, and have been able to then share our learnings with the network, um, both within the grantees and in the broader field through webinars that we've put on like employer engagement or when the pandemic hit, virtual student recruitment opportunities, um, as well as uh, hosting an annual site visit, uh, our National Youth Apprenticeship Summit, um, which this year will be uh, actually in New York with our New York part program, um, October 18th through the 20th. Um, so keep an eye out for that coming up. Um, but we also get to learn because none, none of us have all of the answers here. And, and so we've also benefited from learning from 
um, grantees and partners um, that are doing this work and starting up and finding new ways to do this um, from our friends at, at Trident Tech and the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program, which I know is speaking next. And I know some of my colleagues are hopping on the phone with Melissa later this week to learn more about healthcare uh, pathways that they do. Um, and, and so there's this constant continuous improvement and evolution of learning that happens through the network. And we've been grateful to be a part of it. Thanks, Ryan. And let me throw it to Melissa at Trident Technical College in Charleston, South Carolina next. Melissa? I am Melissa Sterwasser with Trident Technical College and also the Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeship Program. Um, we were really fortunate because we have been doing apprenticeships for over 40 years in the adult space with some of our local employers. And so we um, had the great gift of Boeing coming to town. And in some cases, that was not necessarily a gift for some of our smaller manufacturers who were immediately terrified. So we had the great luxury of having an employer approach us in 2013 to ask us if we would do a youth apprenticeship program. And so we launched that program with our local partners, our K-12 school districts, a number of employers who were willing to hire 16, 17, and 18-year-old students and put them into their plants while they were duly enrolled in classes with us. So we served as the regional, uh, uh, as the RTI provider for those programs, but we were also serving as the intermediary for the partnership that was developing. So we started in 2014 with one pathway and 13 students, six companies, and now we are in 10 different industry sectors. We are about to add education this year. We grow each year. We have over 20 different occupations in the region. Um, and so we've really invested ourselves in this work. We're excited about doing it. We were fortunate to have been approached by New America to be a part of the partnership and joined with Ryan in the very beginning to help craft some of these principles and really are invested in that. We have seen such incredible success for our region and our students that we just cannot help but want to share that in a broader network. And so we spend a lot of time doing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for folks. You know, Ryan's folks have reached out to us about healthcare. This year we have 50, five zero, um, op opportunities for youth apprentices to be hired and placed in hospitals doing direct patient care as early as 16 years of age. Um, and one hospital has told us they could expand that even beyond that. So the opportunities are limitless. We do conferences, we do, um, we answer phone calls, we do webinars, whatever it takes to share the word and the wisdom and to also discover from others where we can improve what we're doing because we're always learning from each other. And that's why the network is so critical for us. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so hopefully get, this gives you a better sense of why we believe this, this learning network is so valuable, um, namely the incredible community of experts and practitioners that it brings together to share lessons learned, explore common challenges, and support and celebrate one another's work. I do see that we are starting to have some questions come up in the chat, and I'd encourage folks to continue posting them there while we're continuing with the program, and we'll come back to them in just a minute. Um, but for now, let me hand things over to my colleague Kelly to share a little bit, um, some more specifics about how you can get involved with the PIA network this year. Thank you. And Fabio, could we bring back up the slide deck, please? All right. Let's go to membership eligibility. All right. So membership eligibility for the PIA network. So membership is open to established youth apprenticeship partnerships in the United States. What do we mean when we say that? So when we say a youth apprenticeship partnership, um, we're talking about a group of organizations who are working together to create and run youth apprenticeship programs. So this little triangle on the right, which is how we usually try to graphically explain these things. Um, there, these organizations usually include school districts, post-secondary schools, community-based organizations, along with employer partners, industry groups. Um, and they are um, usually organized um, by one partner who plays a lead role in convening and coordinating the work of all of these organizations. 
Um, we call that partner sometimes youth apprenticeship intermediary. You may call them the backbone or the lead partner. So there are a lot of different terms, but basically there's usually one organization amongst the partnership who's playing that coordinating role. Membership in the network is open to the partnership as a whole. So anyone in a partnership can participate in those network activities, not just the intermediary or the person who is going to fill out your membership registration form. So anyone at any organization in the partnership is eligible to participate. Next slide, please. Right. So we have divided membership into two types of members. So a local regional type of member. So these are partnerships who are directly working on youth apprenticeship programs in their community. The second type is a statewide member. So these are folks who are supporting a network of communities to launch and scale youth apprenticeship programs, but they are not necessarily the ones who are directly working on programs. Next slide, please. Okay. So for these local member types, to be eligible to join the partnership to advance youth apprenticeship network, Partnerships must be committed to creating youth apprenticeships aligned to the PIA definition and principles for high quality youth apprenticeships. Partnerships must have youth apprentices currently enrolled in apprenticeship or are working to launch a pilot within the next year. So we're really focused on supporting programs who are already existing or are really at that launch stage. And then to maintain membership, the lead intermediary organization for each partnership must complete the annual member information form. So that is how you will be applying for membership. And then just each year you'll be submitting it again. For statewide eligibility, the eligibility requirements are similar. So you must support at least one local partner who meets the criteria for local or regional membership. So as a statewide member, as I said earlier, you are probably not the ones who are directly working on youth apprenticeship programs. But in the community you support, they need to have at least one program that meets their criteria for local or regional membership. And similarly, you must be committed to creating youth apprenticeships aligned to the PIA definition and principles. And similarly, you must fill out the membership information form once a year. All right, next slide. So I thought that that might've been a little bit confusing. So I have this example here with We Can Texas. So We Can Texas is an organization in the great state of Texas, and they support communities across their state to grow apprenticeships. We Can Texas themselves doesn't uh, create youth apprenticeship programs, but they support communities across the state who do. So We Can Texas can apply as a state member. They're, the communities that they support can apply as local members. Next slide, thank you. So I know that we have several folks on the call who are currently PIA network members and they might be wondering, wait a second, so what, what does this mean for me? So what does this mean for you if you are currently a PIA network members? So for 2023, PIA network activities will be reserved exclusively for network members and potential members must satisfy new membership requirements. So chief among them is filling out this registration form. And in this registration form, we'll ask you just for some more information about your partnership and your apprenticeships. And the other new membership requirement is that you must have at least one youth apprenticeship currently in existence or plan to launch on this timeline of within the next year. Just reviewing my notes to see if there are any other important points that I should make. Yes, so um, if you do not 
If you're not eligible for PIA Network membership, we will continue to host public webinars and make our publications available to the general public. But the bulk of network opportunities of site visits, peer-to-peer -peer and affinity group meetings, academies, working groups like the data work group, um, and technical assistance from PIA partners will be reserved exclusively for network members. So if you are currently a network member and would like to continue to be a network member, make sure you fill out the membership registration form um, that we will be getting to you shortly. All right, let's move forward to how to apply. You will apply via the network member interest form. So the form is going to ask about the organizations in your partnership. So like I mentioned, for partnerships, we know that several organizations participate in these youth apprenticeships. So the form will ask you, what are each of these organizations that are members of your partnership? The form will ask a couple of questions about your youth apprenticeships. We'll ask how many apprentices are enrolled, how many employers are hiring apprentices. It will ask um, about some gender and racial ethnic breakdown, if you have access to that data. Um, and the form will ask about your commitment to the PIA definition and principles. After you submit your form, the PIA team will review to determine your eligibility and we'll get back to you to let you know. A link to the form will be sent out next week um, after this webinar when it will go live. Next slide. So who should fill out this form? So only one form per partnership needs to be submitted. Our recommendation is that the backbone organization is probably the best partner to submit the form because they're most likely to have all of the answers close at hand. The form will ask for the name of that backbone partner um, and for the other organizations that make up the partnership. And it will also ask for the name of the partnership. So for example, um, our friends in New York, um, they. Uh, the lead organization is Say Yes Buffalo, and the partnership name is CareerWise Greater Buffalo. So when they're filling out their membership form, they would say our lead organization, our backbone is Say Yes Buffalo. Our partnership name is CareerWise Greater Buffalo. Now, we know not all of you um, might have established branded partnership names. And that's okay, we don't expect you to, um, but try to use in the name that your partner organizations are most likely to recognize, because this will help as we communicate out to you all to help people um, understand about uh, the network opportunities that are available. But if you're confused about partnership name or have any questions, feel free to just, just reach out and ask for clarification. So when is the membership interest form due? It will be due Friday, March 24th by midnight Pacific time. So in about three weeks from now. And the other question that I wanted to address before we go into open Q&A is what if you're not ready yet? What if I've just sort of gone through the eligibility requirements and you go like, oh, well, we're, we're not there yet. We're not gonna be launching a youth apprenticeship pilot within the next year. But we have, you know, we have partners together and we're interested and we're working on this. Will there be an opportunity to join later? And the answer is yes. As I said earlier, we will still be having public opportunities that are open to the entire apprenticeship community in the U.S. And they'll be tailored to folks who are more this earlier stage of things. So Youth Apprenticeship 101 type um, activities and events. And registration for the network will reopen at a later date. And we'll make sure to continue to give that information about when network membership reopens. It'll go out in the PIA network newsletter. So if you're hearing all of this and you're hearing like, this is great, I would love to be a part of it, um, but we're not ready yet. Don't worry, you can stay involved um, and network membership registration will open again in the future. So with that, we are ready for open Q&A, but I want to see if, Sarah, you have any immediate sort of things to, to say after monitoring the chat to jump in on. We had just a couple of questions come up in the chat so far. Um, why don't I start with those questions? And if other folks have questions that you'd like to ask, 
please raise your hand in Zoom and we will um, ask, invite you to come off mute in just a moment. Um, so one of the first questions that was asked um, by Richard was, how does YA work with registered apprenticeship programs? And both Ryan and Melissa have jumped in and already answered these questions some, but we can kind of add a little bit more detail. Um, I think one thing that's worthwhile to know is that, that it's exactly as Ryan said, the registered apprenticeship process works exactly the same for youth apprenticeship programs. You need to identify the occupation you're focused on. You need to define what the training plan is for that occupation. And you have to identify a, a training partner that you're going to be working with. And so that process is pretty straightforward and familiar to those of you who are already familiar with the registration process via USDOL or via your states. And then Sid asked um, about if we could talk a little bit more about what types of employers are hiring high school students. What industries or sectors are they in? And both Melissa and Ryan chimed in and I think answered the big picture answer to this question, which is in every sector, we see a wide range of different types of employers getting involved with youth apprenticeship. What that doesn't mean, though, is that there's not education that has to go on to help under those employer partners understand um, and have their liability concerns addressed to understand what it means to work with a young person and how they can effectively support them and bring them on. And so that's the type of um, information and resources and examples that we can help to connect you with through our many partners in the network who have a lot of experience working with employers on questions like those. Let's see if we have some additional questions and I'll throw them your way, Kelly. Um, it looks like we have one coming up. Uh, Here's, here's a question from Ellen in the chat. So for existing partners, is there a deadline for completion of the annual membership form? Yes, the deadline is the same, uh, March 24th. And that is because, as we mentioned, the network activities will now be closed except for uh, to network members. So please get your form in on time so that you all can have access to those network opportunities, which will be getting started pretty soon. We have another question from Stephanie who asks, are K-12 school systems eligible for membership? We've been running a youth apprenticeship program for four years. Yes, yep, K-12 school systems are eligible for membership. Excellent. Um, I do have a comment in here from Vince who says, anyone who wants to be part of a California network, please let me know. We'd love to have you join a statewide network for California. There's a lot of youth apprenticeship work underway in California, and we're always interested in learning more about it and helping to connect all of the folks that are doing work there, including a couple of our PIA um, grantees who work in the state of California. So please get in touch with Vents or with us if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, I see from Leslie, um, we have a question. We've been running an IT software development pre-apprenticeship for several years and are working on an apprenticeship program this year. I think we should go ahead and join. Does PIA have any resources for national employers who are willing to participate? It's a great question. That is a great question. And yes, based on what you've said, it does sound, since you're planning to launch a youth apprenticeship this year, you are eligible to join. Um, and I, what, what types of resources for national employers? Um, we have definitely built multiple resources for the field. You can check them out on our resource page. Um, but yeah, let, let us know more about the types of resources you're looking for. We're just, just job placements primarily. It's like not all employers are willing to hire six students 16 to 24 uh, in that age group. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to find jobs than it is to find students who want jobs. In other words, or we're into the training. And that is a piece of the work that we do. So we, we tend to do a lot of work with sites around thinking about employer engagement strategies and some of that employer education work. And we can share both resources and some guidance with you um, to support that kind of work. But it, it is hard. It, it is the most, one of the most challenging parts of youth apprenticeship work is making the case to businesses that this is something that they can and should take on and that it's really an amazing opportunity for them to build a talent pipeline for their organizations and in their communities. And Sarah, if I could chime in there. Please do. We, we have found, you know, initially, yes, it was a little difficult to get some of the employers to hop on board, but once it became successful in win, one industry, then they started asking us to do it for theirs. You know, HVAC approached us, automotive approached us, um, the culinary industry approached us in Charleston. And so in some cases, we now have more positions available for students than we have students who are interested. In some cases, it's the opposite. We have more interest by the students than we have positions somewhere out there trying to convince folks. So 
I think that that paradigm changes as as you get into it and people see that it's workable and that you have success. I think it's very similar to what, if, for those of you who have worked with sector partnerships in your community, often getting the first couple of employer partners to come on board in those partnerships is very challenging as well. But once they start to see the, the success that their peers are having, being part of those networks, um, you often find that many folks become much more eager to join. Which is why I said we were so lucky in the first place because the employer approached us. Then we exactly. had to convince a few others to jump on board. But peer pressure is also powerful. Once That's one right. hospital got on board, the others were going, oh, we're going to be left out. And then they wanted to be on board as well. So it, it's contagious. Thanks, Melissa. We have a question from Adrian. Can you speak more about the classroom component? What topics are typically covered if students work in a wide range of industries? Kelly, Kelly's a former teacher, so I will ping Kelly to start us on that one. And then Ryan and Melissa, if you want to weigh in, you're welcome to also. Sure. So um, for this one, I think that uh, what uh, what's meant when they say students work in a wide range of industries is that there are youth apprenticeships now in a wide range of industries. Um, so and a lot of industries that aren't typical for apprenticeships in the United States. So beyond construction, the skilled trades, as we've heard already, there are youth apprenticeships in the healthcare sector, um, youth apprenticeships in business operations. Um, and so um, that's what's meant when we say that youth apprenticeships, uh, youth apprentices are working in a wide range of industries, but within that youth apprenticeship, um, so within a healthcare youth apprenticeship, you know, the classroom component, the related technical instruction will be related to those healthcare topics. Um, and that classroom component looks different um, in different apprenticeships and in different communities. Um, but a lot of communities try to include um, career technical education as a part of that classroom component, both at the secondary and post-secondary level. Um, and they try and include um, and according as as we really try to hold up including post-secondary credit as part of youth apprenticeships is a, a real priority for us and for uh for our partners and i'm sure that um our partners on the call can speak to this classroom component better than me so if any of them would like to share a little bit more about the classroom components of youth apprenticeships please hop in yeah, Kelly, i'll just speak from crew as this perspective because we we cover such a broad kind of set of uh, geographies, there isn't kind of a one size fits all for that. Different districts, different schools have different uh, CT pathways that can be leveraged. And where there isn't that existing CT pathway or that CT pathway doesn't fully fit with the student's schedule when you factor in the workplace learning side, we try not to let that become a barrier that often becomes an equity issue. We try to find alternative mechanisms for that level of instruction that coincides with their education so that it's um, online learning through Udemy or LinkedIn, um, uh, Coursera. And we try to align all that to industry credentials and then often work with our higher education institutions for prior learning credit so that they're getting both that post-secondary credit as well as that industry credential as their related instruction is kind of going along through their apprenticeship. Apologies for the dog coughing in the background. <laughs> Ours Thanks, Ryan. Is, Melissa, go ahead. Ours is a little different approach because where Ryan has a statewide perspective as an intermediary, we are a technical college and we have a three county service region that makes up the Charleston metro area. So we are the RTI provider for the most part. However, we have very, very strong partnerships with our K-12 system. And so if, the, for example, we started with industrial mechanics, our K-12 partners did not have industrial mechanics curricula. And so all of the students came to us and they took the exact same career specific classes for that occupation that our adult students take. Um, in the case of culinary, when they got started, some of our schools had culinary programs. So we sat down and we mapped out the curricula. And so if they start in culinary one at their high school, they're getting our first course credit. If they're taking culinary two, it's the second course. So they can start with them, or if they don't have that opportunity, they can start in our courses. And then they go through the same culinary certificate program that our adults would go through. So although we are serving as Kelly pointed out a wide range of occupations in a wide range of sectors. This, the, re the related technical instruction is very specific to the occupation that they are pursuing and they're being trained in that way. So our students are duly enrolled, 
um, and they are getting college credit in every single program that they are pursuing. And dual enrollment can be a really powerful strategy for youth apprenticeship for folks in states that have a really friendly um, environment where there's financing available to help pay for high school students to get that credit, which is not in the case in all places, but it still makes it a possibility more broadly. It's not the case in our area. We, um, it, the tuition is at the, at the expense of the parents and the students, but we as a college have committed and we as a community have committed to this and you will be amazed at the philanthropic dollars you can draw down and the federal dollars you can draw down to make those tuition costs go away if you're committed to this and if your partnership's committed to it. Um, and that's the kind of training that the Pioneer Network allows you to pursue, right? We are all interconnected. And so when Ryan has a problem, he comes to me or an idea, he comes to me when I have an issue, I'll go to Ryan or to one of the other uh, part people within the network or one of the other grantees, you know, some of our, the grantees have been doing just incredible work. And so we can reach out to one another to share and to learn. And that's critical. Sean, is there anything else you'd want to add to the classroom component from a school district perspective? Sure. Um, one example of a way one of our partners has kind of found a workaround. We actually have an HVAC program, but many of the smaller school districts around don't. Um, and the sheet metal workers is one of our partners. They have what we've done to kind of help facilitate that is many of them might not have a HVAC program, but a lot of our CTE schools have a welding program and welding is a component of that. And so mm -hmm. that curriculum is within it. And so they leverage that to get the students started. And then they'll obviously expand once they get in their trade school after they graduate. But that that component um, is the piece that they can pull them in for the related instruction into the, the um, registered apprenticeship. And so that's an example of a way to kind of get creative and are there, or maybe you have a marketing program and it's a business, mm -hmm. uh, some type of business or banking uh, apprenticeship, you can you can leverage that. I know Ryan and CareerWise has done a lot on that side of some of the non-traditional stuff. We're just dipping our toes into some of the more non-traditional apprenticeships, um, but where we're having the most success is the trades, but we're trying to get, you know, break into the non-traditional things. And creativity and partnership really are the name of the game because there, a lot of times there are all these existing resources that are already there in your communities. It's the matter of mapping them together and aligning them so that they become a more cohesive pathway for young people um, to move into these opportunities. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Are there, is there anyone else who'd like to hop off mute and um, ask a question? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. So we will follow up um, both to um, folks who are subscribers for the PIA newsletter, as well as to everyone who registered for today's webinar. We'll make sure that you get a copy of the recording for today's webinar, um, as well as a link to that registration form. If you have questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can find our information on the New America website or send us an email at PIA at newamerica.org. Um, Kelly, anything else you'd like to say before we close out? Thank you all for your time, and we look forward to continuing to work with those of you that we've worked with, and we look forward to getting to know those of you who are new to the PIA community. And a shout out again to our colleague Fabio for helping with production today, and to Melissa and Sean and Ryan for sharing some of their insights with us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.